Hi everyone, welcome to this event by Champaka Bookstore with Shabani Basu in conversation with Vivek Shanbag about her latest book, The Mystery of the Parsi Lawyer. I'll just introduce Champaka and the speakers and then hand the conversation over to them. Champaka is an independent women-run bookstore, children's library and cafe. We bring diverse stories and perspectives for our readers and in our children's library to our books and events. We have an online store that ships across India where you can find all the books on our shelves, including The Mystery of the Parsi Lawyer. Shrabani Basu is a journalist and Sunday Times bestselling author. Her books include the critically acclaimed Mystery of the Parsi Lawyer, For King and Another Country, Victoria and Abdul, Spy Princess, and Kari the story of the nation's favorite book. She has always combined her journalism with her love of history, and all her books have evolved from her observations about the shared histories of India and Britain. Vivek Shandag is the author of eight works of fiction and two plays, all of which have been published to wide acclaim in Canada. She was a fall 2016 resident of the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. That's where Gochat is the first of his books to appear in English. Uh, now a little bit about the book. Uh, in the village of Great Worley near Burn Birmingham, someone is mutilating horses. Someone is also sending threatening letters to the vicarage, where the vicar, Shapur Adalji, is a Parsi convert to Christianity and the first Indian to have a parish in England. His son, George, quiet, socially awkward, and the only boy at school with distinctly Indian features, grows up into a successful barrister, till he is improbably linked to and then prosecuted for the above crimes, in a case that left many convinced that justice hadn't been served. When he is released early, his conviction still hangs over him. Having lost faith in the police and the legal system, George turns to the one man he believes can clear his name the one whose novels he spent his time reading in prison, the creator of the world's greatest detective. When he writes to Arthur Conan Doyle, asking him to meet, Conan Doyle agrees. The Don't give away too life. much miracle. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. This is all the only public information. Yeah. Uh, it's an eye-opening look at race and an unexpected friendship in the early days of the 20th century. You can get your copy on www.champaka.in. We ship across the country. Uh, I'd also like to ask anyone who's viewing, if you have any questions at any point, please just write them in the comments and the speakers will get to them towards the end of the event. <laughs> Handing over the conversation to you. Thank you, Nirika. And uh, Shabani, first of all, congratulations for a wonderful book. What a fascinating book this is. Uh, it is uh, so compelling. Once you start, it is impossible to stop this. And as I was telling you, I did it in, you know, I read it in two sittings. Uh, once, uh, you know, uh, 200 pages in one sitting and the rest in the, in the second one. It's fantastic. And the <laughs> Thank you. Thank is, you so much. Yeah. And the narrative is, you know, it is almost, it's like, uh, it's like fiction. And uh, it happens because I think you have eye for details. And, and as I was telling you, you know, some time ago that it is, it is like a, it is like what a fiction writer does, picking up uh, significant detail, you know, what James Joyce calls a significant detail. And there is absolutely, it, it is filled with so many details and, and the story and the narrative unwinds in such a beautiful way, but there's not even once that the details are, you know, repetitive and uh, uninteresting. It, it's a fantastic uh, uh, book and congratulations again. Thank you uh, so much. We, yeah. I must tell you, Vivek. I, I yeah. read your book in one go, <laughs> so I beat you there, <laughs> Gachar Gochar, which is only one in, in translation, but it had such beautiful detail. I could smell the food <laughs> and made me very hungry. <laughs> the South Indian cooking and everything that is going on. Oh. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, before I really ask you something about your art of writing, which I'll do maybe end of this conversation, mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, talk about this book. Um, when was uh, the seed of this book? And what I mean is, what really made you uh, go after this story? And who is this Parsi lawyer you are talking about? <laughs> right. Okay. So let's start with the Parsi lawyer. He is 28 year, year old George Edalji. 
he is a lawyer. Uh, he works in Birmingham. He lives in a village called Great Worley, where his father, Shapurji Adalji, is the vicar of this. Um, and here we have this lovely photo. You can see this is the family. Shapurji in his you know, priest robes. He's the vicar of the place. He's the first Asian vicar of, uh, uh, you know, to have a, his own parish in, in the UK. Uh, and of course, Shapurji was, uh, uh, he is from Bombay. He um, converted, he's a, he was a Parsi. He converted as a teenager to Christianity and he wanted to go and study, uh, you know, and become a priest. So he, he funds his own way and he comes to England. And finally, he marries a white lady. Her name is Charlotte. She's English. And, uh, you know, through connections, whatever, he gets this vicar, you know, this robe, job as the vicar. So he's the vicar. And then they have three children. George is the eldest. You can see him here. He's about 16 or 17. And his younger brother, Horace, and younger sister, Maud. Um, so that's George Adalji, who is our main character. And this is the vicarage, Great Worley. It's a mining village. Uh, so the, the composition of the village is... Uh, is sort of a land, uh, you know, those who work in the mines and those who work, who are agricultural laborers, uh, as well as the aristocracy. So it's a very mixed bag. And suddenly to this all white parish, uh, we have a brown man speaking with an Indian accent and preaching the word of Christ to his white parish. So it's tension from scene one, you can imagine. Um, so that's the backdrop. Um, how did I come to this story? Uh, I knew about George. I knew, you know, through I've always been an Arthur Conan Doyle big fan. Uh, and I knew that, um, you know, his biographies and other things, uh, books on Asians in Britain. I knew that the only case he'd ever worked on was that of an Indian lawyer that he had investigated personally. So that was really important to me. I needed to follow this up sometime. Uh, but it was only in 2015 that I started working on the book. Um, in 2015, I read a little rip newspaper report that um, uh, some letters were going up for auction. And these were letters written by Arthur Conan Doyle to the police chief who had been investigating the Adalji case. So for me as a journalist, I just felt, you know, this, there's something in this. There's going to be new material. And when I write, I always want new material. I want, I want the real story. And, uh, you know, that is what I was looking for. So I followed up the trail. And uh, so it really started in 2015 when I found those letters. You know, I, I went to the library finally, got those letters, and then worked around in various other archives and uh, took five years and got the story. Shapurji, when he was in, in Mumbai and that conversion episode, when he was mm -hmm. in Elphinstone College, it's yeah. such a wonderful thing because it is uh, it is so much different than uh, what we uh, at least you know have read and heard because you take us into uh, a particular family you take us into the mind of this uh, young man mm -hmm. who was definitely interested yeah. In, yeah. In, in a new religion and he believed it and you can see that uh, in the rest of his life so mm -hmm. what kind of research went into this to to find out about uh, did you have to uh, do that in india that research or how did you get to know all these details yeah so no i went in uh, you know the, well the archives here are really good so mm -hmm. searching for so a little bit about uh, shapurji um nirika there's the photograph after this of the of the vicarage would you bring that up yeah so this is the vicarage uh, where they lived uh, this is george's room as well on the side um, now, um, I, um, yep, you can, you can take these away now if you like. Um, so then we'll come to the next photographs later. So you could take these away. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, basically he went to Elf. He's from uh, a wealthy Parsi family. As you know, these Parsi families had business interests, you know, textile, cotton, uh, even running the opium, you know, ships. They were, they were very, very prosperous. And so he had been sent to this elite Elephantston College. Um, now, Elephantston College, there was a Reverend Wilson there. And he um, he looked at the Parsons. He was, you know, as a, he had this missionary zeal. And he is going to try and recruit Parsis. They were seen as a community that could, because they were westernized, uh, and the, the English related, you know, very easily with them, 
he felt they could be uh, they were a target so there were a lot of conversions suddenly taking place of students in this college and the parents were really agitated so there's a lot in the book about you know how the parents go and there's actually a siege on the on reverend wilson's house and armed police come in um, and shapurji is just 15 years old he's very influenced and he's very passionate he wants to study the christian texts and eventually he lands up at his door he runs away from home he lands up at wilson's door and says take me in and uh, so we have wilson's records which i accessed here to you know answer your question and wilson yeah. uh, recounts the whole story and he writes about the sermon he writes about um, how uh, what um, edalji says when he is baptized so he is baptized in the amroli church in bombay and he speaks like an evangelist he you know discards his religion and says how uncivilized it was and he's now going to be, you know become civilized and things like that so you know it's all that zeal of a new convert that you hear from shapuji as a very young boy you know he's just 15 uh, but yeah all these records were there in wilson's uh, writing so he's written uh, quite extensively so i was lucky it's a good thing they keep detailed records <laughs> it's very handy for us <laughs> see there is uh, in in your other books as well there is enormous amount of uh, you know archaeological research that has gone in whether it is uh, uh, victoria abdul or durai inayat khan or you know other books now was this uh, any different this particular experience or was it similar how does it uh, you know change from book to book is it because of the story or is it because of you know i'm really curious because the, the kind of uh, effort that goes in and the amount of uh, you know information that we have to arrange and uh, mm -hmm. get into that time because you, you take us you know so uh, smoothly and beautifully into the, into that time in in the 90 mid 19th century and and the later part of uh, uh, that time so was this any different this particular writing this particular book and going through this uh, uh, It and was, also because it, of uh, Doyle, but I'll come to that later. <laughs> it was different because each book has been slightly different. You know, whether I was doing Victoria and Abdul was royalty, so I had to enter that world, <laughs> and you know, go in the royal palaces and the royal archives, and it was different research. Though it was in the Victorian period, so luckily this was also Victorian period, so I've got that in common. And uh, but of course, this for the first time I was looking at police records. <laughs> Uh, which I've not done before. You know, with Victoria, I was looking at uh, you know her letters and archives and her letters to the Viceroy, Secretary of State. So a lot of Home Office, Foreign Office files, even there, Viceroy's papers. But here, I was looking at police records, uh, court case, trial, trial records, and so all that was very exciting. Um, also, I, I, you know, as a journalist myself, I always rely on newspaper reports. So for me, those are really important. <laughs> and because how else do you know what these people of the village are thinking you know only a local journalist will be writing about the terror that's happening how frightened people are and to get the sense of you know what's happening in this village what they think of george edalji the only way i can get that sense is from the newspaper reports and believe me they were shocking <laughs> they the racism was absolutely shocking you know just stark written over there writing about it i i might read a few as we go along um yeah. but yeah this is what happened uh, to the family you know this odd one sole indian family in the village um just completely frowned upon by everybody else and targeted incessantly your introduction is beautiful it is uh, it uh, it makes you want to read the book and <laughs> after reading the book i read the introduction again because it you know it opens up so beautifully with the train leaving uh, birmingham uh, station uh, and then so many things which make again you know it it the whole uh, book can be seen in a different light uh, uh, so i i suggest to the readers that you read the introduction twice <laughs> it it does because uh, you know one appreciates uh, really the amount of work that has gone in and uh, the way you have composed this because uh, as i said uh, you know it's almost reads like fiction because the kind of uh, narrative and the way you have see for example uh, uh, the life of uh, conan doyle and then uh, uh, life of george i i could see these two streams coming 
and then joining at a certain point in time. Uh, can you talk about it? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so what happens is, <clears throat> well, just for our, you know, for all those who are listening in who don't know much about the story, I know Nirika has done a little cap, but basically what happens in this village is that in 1903, which is when, when the book is really set, is that horses, there's sudden terror in the village and horses are being slashed. Somebody is coming at night and mutilating horses, slashing their stomachs and just leaving them to die. All their innards are, you know, spilling out on the fields. It's absolutely gruesome. And for six months, this goes on. Every day there's a horse lying there. You know, as George is passing on this train and he's going to Birmingham, he looks out and there's a horse dead lying there. So, you know, this sort of thing. Villagers are in a complete panic. And anonymous letters, you know, as the rumor mills go around, who is who has done this? Um, anonymous letters start and they start targeting George and saying he's the one who did it. Um, so the police get influenced and the police, of course, are so prejudiced and they, they're they totally, you know, absolutely inept at catching this, um, this criminal. And uh, they just go in and arrest George. When a horse is killed quite close to the vicarage, they just get in there and they arrest him. And then he's tried in a really farcical trial with very minimum evidence, which would not have been allowed in any court. And he, you know, it takes 55 minutes uh, for the jury to say he's guilty, and off he goes. You know, he's sentenced to seven years imprisonment. So he's locked up. Um, and meanwhile, oh yes, yeah, let's have a look at this picture. <laughs> Sorry. This is George when he's arrested. So here we are. Uh, he looks terrible because, uh, I mean, you know, these police photographs, they always look so horrible because he's so shocked. He just, you know, just suddenly being arrested like this. He's a man who led such an ordinary life. He would just, you know, a very boring life. He had no friends. He was a bit of a loner. As you can see, he's, um, his features are very, very pronounced Indian features. Though his mother is white, you know, there's nothing white at all. You can make out that he is Indian. And so his, his features become really important in this whole case. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the press reports, uh, Vivek, I'll just read out one, one thing from the- um, Yeah, sure. The, from the newspaper report. Nirika, you could take this away actually now. And I can, I'll just read a little bit about what these reporters say. You know, it's shocking. So when when the judgment, you know, this 55 minute, he's pronounced guilty, uh, the Daily Mail writes, those who closely studied this extraordinary criminal in the dock would have no doubt that he's a degenerate of the worst type. His jaw and mouth are those of a man of very debased life. Idalji has also gained for himself the reputation of being a lover of mystery, another oriental trait, and one that goes far to explain the anonymous letters. Love of mystery rather than bloodlust was, according to the crown, the predisposing motive. So this whole thing that he's an oriental, you know, the dark oriental who must have done this crime. And then we have the Birmingham Daily Gazette writing, the explanation of the choice is probably to be found in the circumstance that Edalji is of Eastern extraction. The subtle Eastern mind loves a mystery and is vain. The Eastern mind is satisfied with its secret. So you can see how the, you know, the reporters, local reporters writing. And then one writes, we are glad to think that the district of Great Worley and the country is safe from such a monster for several years to come. Now, I mean, George Edalji is no monster. He'd never done anything in his life. You know, he'd written a very boring book on railway law for the commuters. That was the extent of his book. And uh, he had no friends. He was a teetotaler. He went to the club. He didn't do any of the, you know, normal things that most of his colleagues would have done. So in a sense, and because he looked so different, he stood out, you know. Also, he was myopic. So you can see he had slightly, you know, bulging eyes. And... Uh, Sometimes he couldn't recognize somebody. So he might just stare at somebody and, you know, not recognize them, not say hello. Um, so, you know, immediately they think he's odd. Um, so that was another problem going with him. So the entire focus is on his appearance and his Eastern looks and his Eastern background. And this sets up this case. And uh, of course, he's, um, he's in, imprisoned now for seven years. But what happens is that a little campaign starts and he is released on parole uh, after three years. And that's when he he can't practice because he's been struck off the solicitor's roles. 
he can't even live in great valley because he says if i go back and another horse is killed they'll stick me in again he goes and lives in london he has no earnings so he just doesn't know what to do and he writes to arthur conan doyle and he says help me um nirika we have a photo of arthur conan doyle i think so would you like to bring that up um, shabani i like the way you you bring uh, uh, conan doyle because it is not just that it, it doesn't start from the point when uh, george writes to him right. we we almost we we it starts much before that and with his wife and her illness and so we yeah. actually have a glimpse into his life and yeah. then you can you can see that slowly you know he is almost like you know he was waiting for such a break yeah. and that yeah. is beautiful then because then that's what i i meant by you know these two yeah. streams so the two come and that's where they yeah uh, join yeah um nirika you could take this away now thanks we've seen shalak uh, so basically yes because he comes into the story quite late you know the trial yeah. has happened till he writes to him so but i needed to know what was happening in in arthur conan doyle's life at this stage and the interesting thing was that while you know arthur conan doyle himself was uh, he had killed off homes <laughs> you know he, he he was fed up of his creation he sent him down the reichenbach for, uh, falls killed him off and then everybody said bring him back you know homes can't die so he had to bring him back and so this whole story is going on and in this crucial year 1903 when um, all this is happening in great valley is when homes is coming back so you know the chapter a second chapter in arthur conan doyle's life is starting with you know the return of homes so i found these two strands quite interesting before they come together and then in 1906 when you know he gets this letter from george this is a time in his life when he's going through a really low period because his wife has died she's you know struggled with tuberculosis for 13 years and she's died uh, so he is you know mourning her death um at the same time he's consumed by guilt because while she was ill he fell in love with a younger woman called jean lecky and now he's free to marry her but he is you know he's just Uh, torn by the guilt and he says we won't marry for a year in respect for you his wife um, so this dark period of his life when he's brooding uh, is when this letter a fat letter from george edalji arrives on his desk and it says help me you know we need you we need sherlock holmes to clear my name and arthur conan doyle just dives into it he writes that edalji took him from a very dark period in his life and you know just took his mind away this was like a distraction for him and he just gets into this case in full sherlock holmes mode which is fascinating also also one could see because uh, you know the response to uh, what uh, conan doyle does you know his response to his articles and then uh, the letters uh, that pour in and the support that he gets it's a kind of like uh, you know he was almost like testing uh, his uh, influence over um the people uh, over the english people because it was it almost like you know that he was wanting to come out and he was wanting to test that thing yeah, and yeah. that is ob- obviously you know you can the kind of support that he gets and more and more he gets it the the you can see him going from strength to strength and and yeah. supporting him and there is that genuineness you know it was uh, one could see that he was really uh, mm-hmm. wanting to he was uh, you know to get justice for for george yeah yeah totally yeah. he just dived into this case he yeah. started yeah. he went to the yeah. vicarage he interviewed mm-hmm. people he did all the work that the police hadn't done you know yeah. he he made his yeah. list of suspects he did you know mm-hmm. he just said all the evidence is so flimsy mm-hmm. it doesn't stand ground mm-hmm. so he mm-hmm. worked on that and the, the and then he went to press so he wrote these two mm. articles in the daily telegraph where yeah. he was like forensic he just sort of destroyed all the evidence that had come up and said this was a fraud trial and mm. this was a miscarriage of justice and he really um, he's very sharp about um the you know the police um how inefficient they were how misguided they were and especially how prejudiced they were so he mm. brings up all these cases and he is the one who brings up that this family was targeted even before this happened that when george is just mm-hmm. a young boy they received anonymous letters so mm-hmm. all this comes up and this was never brought up at the trial so he brings up all these facts he brings up the fact that george was myopic he says this man could not have crossed the streets at night 
And it's, it's a really beautiful scene. And yeah. he deduces, like Sherlock Holmes, you know, the first meeting they have is incredible because he says, you know, meet me. And he asks him to meet him at the Grand Hotel in Trafalgar Square. And um, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle is a little late getting to the meeting. Uh, so when he reaches, he just stands near the lobby and he looks. And of course, he can recognize George. He's the only Indian in that room. And he's just like Sherlock Holmes does, you know, the power of deduction as we, you know, all those who read Sherlock Holmes know how his methods are. Um, he's, so before he's even spoken one word to George, he's deduced. He sees George reading the newspaper, holding it really close to his face. And he says, he's myopic. He couldn't have crossed those fields at night, you know, on a sort of English summer day when it's raining, of course, it's pitch dark <laughs> and it was in August. And he says, um, there's no way he could have crossed fields, slashed animals and come back. So uh, he knows immediately, he's deduced, just like Sherlock Holmes, he's deduced <laughs> that he couldn't have done it. And uh, he goes. So it is really Sherlockian the way he investigates this this whole mystery, and uh, of course, it has several twists and turns, and I'm not going to talk about them because you have to read them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's 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 the way he goes, and he's passionate about it. He is so passionate, um, and he befriends George. He's really protective about him. So even when he gets married, he marries Jean, uh, you know, yeah. in September yeah, in 1907. And one of the guests at the wedding is, um, you know, our George Adalji. <laughs> and you can just imagine, you know, it's a wedding reception of the most elite of London's literary, literary society. You know, all the authors are there. Bram Stoker, uh, who wrote Dracula. You have uh, J.M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan. You have um, probably, I think, uh, GBS uh, Shaw was also probably there. So all the great publishers, everybody there, the champagne is flowing beautifully decorated in this hotel. And there standing in a corner is the awkward figure of George Adalji. And um, Arthur Conan Doyle says he was the guest that he was proudest of. So, you know, there's a real genuine fondness for him over there as well. There are so many, uh, you know, strands in this book that run parallelly. You know, there is the, the struggle of immigrants, their isolation, you know, the racism, there is this arrogance of bureaucracy fight for justice, many things. Mm -hmm. uh, and almost every major incident of this book resonates with uh, what's happening today. Uh, did you consider this when you uh, chose to write about George or did you discover this as you went along? Well, it's only when, you know, when I started the, with uh, researching, I didn't know how bad these letters were. I didn't know about these letters. Mm -hmm. All I knew is that Arthur Conan Doyle had investigated the case. So, you know, the details of the case I had no idea about. Uh, but uh, when I saw these letters in the box, you know, this sort of vile language, um, you can imagine, you know, what racist letters are. I mean, today, now we have trolls who use the same sort of, you know, language. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, there was not only letters, the house was painted with graffiti, um, excreta was thrown in through, you know, the window, uh, things were left outside their house. It was a total, you know, sort of under siege is how they felt. There were false letters going out, false advertisements placed, um, you know, of salacious things like offering sexual services and with the name of the vicar under it. So you can imagine how terrible this is for the vicar, you know, contact Shapurji Adalji with some woman advertising her services. So it was that sort of hoax and, uh, you know, attack at a, at a very deeply hurtful level and also dangerous. Uh, because uh, can you imagine how terrified they must have felt seeing, you know, I'm going to murder your son, basically. 12-year-old son saying, you know, I can bet 50, 50 pounds that he'll be in his grave, uh, you know, soon. Things like that. And, and they, ordered, uh, they ordered various, you know, all kinds of things in, in his name. And yeah. materials started landing at his vicarage. This sort of oppression. But the thing yeah. was, yeah. when I read all these, I was, you know, just thinking that, yes, miscarriages of justice have happened here in Britain so much. You know, you had, with, especially with the IRA, you had the Guildford Four, Birmingham Six. These are very famous English yeah. cases here where police manipulated files. And this same sort of thing was happening here. I mean, the, you know, still happening. And of course, racism is something, you know, <laughs> while last year while I was you know, finishing the book and finishing the edits and the pandemic was on is when Black Lives Matter exploded mm -hmm. around the world, in the Western world. And uh, my goodness, it was like all over. And you just felt 
Yes, I mean, George's story is over 100 years ago, but this is still happening. Suddenly, everyone was pouring their stories out. You know, it's um, you one knows about, you know, Paki bashing that happened in the 70s and 80s and everything. And, you know, all these shopkeepers would have their shops painted, Paki written on it, and they would just paint it the next day, clean it up, mend the windows which were shattered, and just get back to work. That's how the immigrants worked those days. I felt Shapurji was doing that 100 years ago. Uh, but when Black Lives Matter you know, exploded last year, it was like famous footballers coming out, famous cricketers coming out and saying what they had faced. And these are celebrities who were talking about it. Um, and and our ordinary people as well. And you just felt that this is still happening. You know, we know it's happening. This sort of underlying tension that is always there, that is ready to explode. And um, uh, it was glaring that this is still going on. And, uh, you know, you just, they're just blindsiding it. We just had a report published last week which said, oh, Britain is a shining example to the Western world on racism and we are the best. So, I mean, it's been laughed uh, at the report, but this was a government commission report. So, you know, it's it just has no merit at all <laughs> because institutional racism does exist and they have said this over and over again. And prejudice, prejudice exists. Yeah, it's it's unconscious bias, but uh, what absolutely. we see in the book. Is, <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know, I, I mean, I George was in, before he was even in the dock, they didn't need you know they just seen his face, <laughs> and in fact he tells a policeman later, you know, you no, know, he tells a journalist later, many years later, that the police should know that if somebody has a name that you can't pronounce, they may not necessarily be a foreigner. And every foreigner has not done the most gruesome crime. And I thought that was, you know, really quite touching as well as uh, just makes so much sense. And also now it's still relevant today because uh, even during the pandemic, you know, you had, because everyone was in lockdown, who was stopped and searched the most if they were out on the street, it was black and Asian people straight away. Who was fined the most black and Asian people? Simply, you know, that is how it is. <laughs> There was a black MP who was driving her car at a Mercedes with a friend in East London, and she was pulled up. And she had to say, I'm an MP, <laughs> this is my car. You know, how can a black woman drive a Mercedes in East, in East London? So it's just these, these prejudices and these biases that keep coming up, um, which are still there in society and around the world. I won't say it's just Britain, you yeah. know, it's America. It's India. It's everywhere. It's there, it's there in, in different forms and different ways, and which is why I said they resonate so much with uh, even what's happening in India. So exactly. it is, it is, you know, it is there in in as I said in different forms and absolutely, yeah. you know, uh, where it's color of your skin, somewhere it's your race, somewhere it's your caste, somewhere it's your religion. It's yeah. very yeah. Thing. and the fear yeah. of the foreigner is universal. You know, somebody yeah. who's there is an alien. We don't yeah. want him. Yeah. Yeah, we had Brexit. You know, that was yeah. fueled entirely by yeah. you know fear of the foreigner. In this case, mm -hmm. East Europeans they didn't want them coming. Um, mm -hmm. In in America, you know, they built a wall to keep the Mexicans out. Yeah. So it it just happens everywhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, you you have you know, this enormous material which you went through, and obviously you have to put a frame to present it to us. You know, so which means that uh, a lot of things get left out. Is there anything that that was uh, that that you feel was important, but because of size of your frame that you left out in this uh, while constructing this book? Um, you know, I could have gone on with uh, the details of everything. Mm -hmm the various mm. cases, the, the media reports, and also the investigation that Arthur Conan Doyle does. But mm. I just had to cut it because I just felt this is just mm. too much detail. And you know, the reader, A, he's going to get lost. And the last thing you want to do is get the reader confused <laughs> because yeah. uh, you know it's really hard. So I tried to keep it simple. So you know, if you get confused, I did my best you know, to all the readers. But no, I, I, I Mm -hmm. There is so much going on and you have to distill it into a narrative. So it was really quite hard to write because of, mm -hmm. you know, so many things. It's not just a clear narrative. Um, say a book like Spy Princess, in that sense, it, just narration was easier mm -hmm. because it is from, you know, it is following her life. It's a short life. Mm -hmm. It's one life and things that are happening around it. Uh, but something like this, where there are two strands, two people from different ends, 
it's a bit like Victoria and Abdul in that sense, two people from different ends of the spectrum meeting. But here there's a case going on, there's a crime, there's all sorts of things happening. So it, it was hard to distill and do. But uh, anyway, I hope, I hope they like it. <laughs> I hope the reader likes it. It is, it is. Uh, may I request you to read a, a couple of passages? From yeah, the book? sure. Sure. Um, let me read one when George is in prison. He is, uh, I've read the press and now, uh, so after his sentence is passed, then George goes to prison. He's taken to uh, Canuck police station, the local, um, it's the police lockup, so it's not the jail yet. Canuck police station had two small cells for the detention of prisoners. George was locked in one. He described it later as the worst cell he had ever seen or heard of. As they closed the door on him, it was almost pitch dark. It had no gas or other artificial light. He was told he could not have a lamp or candle lest he set fire to himself. There was no bell, and the only way to attract attention was to thump or kick the door. This he did loudly at one point in the night. He was told that he had disturbed a policeman who was saying his prayers before he left on duty. The only furniture in the cell was a fixed bench, which worked as a chair, table, and bed. A constable needled him. Well, Mr. Edalji, he said, I'm sorry to see you here, but how did you manage to slip by all our chaps? What time did you put the horse through it? Give the show away or someone else will. Through the evening, the police tried to make him talk so he could incriminate himself, but George would not oblige. His training as a lawyer had taught him that prisoners often had their words twisted out of context and ended up in trouble for what they said casually at the police station. All night long, the police kept a strict watch to see that he could not attempt suicide. The cell was pitch dark and he could see nothing. Every hour from 8 p.m. till 2 a.m., an officer would come with a lantern to check on him and try to make him talk. On the sixth appearance, George told him not to come again and he went away. There was no water in the cell. When George asked for some, he was told he could not have any because prisoners tried to drown themselves by holding their heads underwater in the bucket. Finally, well past 2 a.m., tired, thirsty, and worried, George fell into a troubled sleep. It had been exactly 10 years since the last anonymous letter declared that George Adalji would be sent to his grave. So this is uh, George's first night in the cell. As you can see, it's a horrible night because he is, uh, he himself is a solicitor. So he's, he's defended people, but here he is for the first time in a jail. <laughs> Uh, in a police lockup. It wasn't the jail at this stage, it's the police lockup. He goes to the jail afterwards. <laughs> and the jail, like every other jail, sounds horrible. A Victorian prison, you know, police lockup would have been absolutely horrible. Will this book also be made into a film? <laughs> <laughs> that is not in my hands, Vivek. <laughs> that is up to studios and filmmakers. But uh, yes, we had, uh, you know, interest, but uh, it's not in my hands and we just have to wait and see. <laughs> What happens? This is an interesting uh, book, mm -hmm. and there's so many twists, and it's uh, almost you know like uh, um, it's like a thriller, <laughs> more than a thriller, of course. <laughs> well, I can never be as good as Arthur Conan Doyle, but you know, <laughs> I have to <laughs> pay him respect, and so write it, <laughs> write it in his style. Mm -hmm. oh, at least, at least try to do that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I know the book is just out and it may be too early to expect any responses, but have you got any uh, any response from uh, Indian community in UK or uh, Parsi community? Um, well, uh, it's got great reviews so far. So that's the one yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, uh, it's really been reviewed in nearly all the papers and they've mm. just given an excellent review, said Sherlockian and said, all the new material is really interesting. So most have found that all that really interesting, especially the fight between um, Arthur Conan Doyle and Anson, who is the police chief. Yeah. So that bit is also very exciting <laughs> because that really dominates the last bit of the book because they are at it. You know, Anson is the police chief who's racist, who hates George Adalji and who um, describes him, uh, describes Shapurji as the Hindu vicar and just hates mm -hmm. the family. And he does everything to stop Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, investigating this. He lays false traps for him. He does, you know, all sorts of police things. He's a real corrupt cop. 
but he's a really uh, imperialist and an aristocrat. So that is also interesting. So there's one aristocrat, Anson, and there's you know Arthur Conan Doyle, who's the best known writer. So Arthur Conan Doyle and they, their clash over this case is fascinating. So um, yeah, the reviews have been great. Um, people coming like today, I got an email. So I'm always waiting for you know relatives or somebody to contact me. I want I want to find that Idalji family, whatever was left of it in in Bombay, because Kapurji had brothers and sisters. They must be there somewhere, you know, their descendants. Um, George and his sister Maud, they had no children. So their family line is finished. They didn't have, the children didn't have children, any others. So that line is over. But there must be Idalgis in Bombay, you know, who were Shapuji's brothers and sisters, and they must have had children. So there's somebody around. It would be lovely if they came forward. But today I got an email from somebody who said she was George's relative from his mother's side. So her, he, uh, George's grandmother's sister is her line of ancestry. And uh, it's a lovely email where she said her father had told her they were related to George, uh, but she didn't know how. And she worked it out when, you know, when she read my book. And then I write about George's grave because I went and found his grave. And it was just covered in weeds. There was, you couldn't find it. It took me four hours to find this grave. And uh, so she went with her. Uh, happened and they went to the grave <laughs> and they looked at it uh, they said it is really in a bad state but uh, they hope to go and repair it soon so that's that's nice <laughs> and she says she hoped that you know her her ancestors had looked after george and you know been there to support him when he was in trouble so that's nice mm -hmm. so it's always nice when people come up and you know give little anecdotes and their connections um there are people from great worldly who said oh they were born in Great Worldly and I was baptized in um, that same church, St. Mary's Church, and I had no idea about this story, so thank you. So I, I get a lot of mail like that, which is, uh, you know, it's a story that's been forgotten. So people even in the area don't really know that much about it, which is great. So it's good to tell them that all this happened. <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle came to this village to investigate a case and, you know, put it in the on the world map in a way because George became famous even in the U.S. This article yeah, yeah, yeah. carried even and in the U.S. That is this wonderful yeah. uh, part where uh, Conan Dial, yes. you know, goes uh, and and finds out, you know, a character in the U.S. I won't uh, talk about yeah. it much, but then it's the most interesting bit uh, yeah, of, yeah. of the book because it's you know so far away and then still look at the mm -hmm. coincidence. I don't know whether it's a coincidence or it's still still a mystery, but then, you know, something like that happening is really wonderful. Yeah, it was amazing. And also because the articles were published in the Washington Post as well mm -hmm. and New York mm -hmm. Times. So, you know, they got to know. And of course, Arthur Conan Doyle is big in the US. So they got fascinated with this real life case that he was investigating. Mm -hmm. So George became quite famous. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, he had a very really tortured life, but he did become quite famous at the time. So, anyway, but he was a fighter. I do feel he he had a good fight in him. He he continued, <laughs> continued campaigning, continued. And, and it's uh, so heartening to see that he did not, you know, let it go, and his spirits were high, despite because if you see the kind of. Uh, violence that was uh, inflicted on him from from his childhood yeah. uh, and and his loneliness and he was it's not that he had great support of course once Condale came into the uh, mm -hmm. scene that is different but then even before that his uh, you know ability to fight and that uh, building out that hope is something extraordinary yeah it is extraordinary i mean this man was faced racism as a child then there's all this crime. He's then imprisoned. He spends three years with hardened criminals. Yeah. And he writes that the person next to him. You know, I have some of the accounts of the jail because he himself wrote about it. So yeah. he wrote the article in Pearson's Weekly. In fact, we have a photo, Nirika. Maybe you'd like to bring that up of the articles uh, that George himself wrote and which were published at the time. Um, Nirika, would you like to bring up that photo? It's an advertisement of one of George's articles. So he um, he was uh, you know quite involved in getting his story across. So I would say he did good PR for himself. He spoke to journalists quite openly. Mm -hmm. He wrote the articles himself. He had the gall to you know how many people have the guts to pick up a pen and write to Arthur Conan Doyle? 
he did. Then uh, you have this one. So this is yeah. an article that George Idalji himself wrote. As you can see, you know, was he innocent, Idalji's story. So we have a lot of the details. Um, thanks, Nirika. Yeah, you could take that away now. Um, so we have a lot of details from his writings about, um, you know, we, we can see that he's in for the fight. He, he says, I will not, I will fight for compensation right till the end. So, you know, good for him. He had quite a fighting spirit. I think, um, and also I, I do think it's it's good. I mean, he he did face so much racism, but also let's not forget he also had ten thousand people who supported him. You know, who wrote yeah. that petition, yeah. and uh, you know, ten thousand is a large number in those days. So there were top lawyers, doctors, academics, writers, all supporting him and saying this is a flawed case, and it was a. You know the, the sort of English uh, spirit that you know a miscarriage of justice won't be tolerated. Um, that fighting spirit sort of came out, and I think it's one of the things that Arthur Conan Doyle also felt very strongly, because even though he's you know, a creature of empire, he believes in empire, he believes in all this. Um, he still he he sees empire as a benevolent force. He sees it as something that you know brings democracy, justice, all these good things to people, apart from cricket and tea, of course. But um, so when that is challenged and there is a miscarriage, he feels he must fight it. <laughs> so in a way, and, he's fighting. And also, yeah. And also, interestingly, he does not think that he's an outsider. See, yeah. while everyone else around him treats him so, but he does not. I mean, there is no evidence for that anywhere in the book or in his letters. Or, because he thinks he is, he is one of them. Yeah, he thinks he's English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which he is. I mean, he's he's you know what they call people from Birmingham. Yeah, they they call them Brummies. You have a Brummy accent. I mean, he probably spoke with a Brummy accent, you know, because he is English. His father himself had left, um, uh, you know, his Parsi faith behind, left his country behind, and come here. So, what is there that is Indian left in Edalji? But he was very proud of his name. He would always say, "This is how it is to be pronounced." He would write that Edalji. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so those little things also show that he is quite proud of his his name and you know his heritage, Parsi heritage, whatever. Even though he's Christian now, but um, he makes it a point to correct people and write it in the articles how to pronounce his name. So these little things show you his character. You know, it's a glimpse into this man. <laughs> he's quite a mysterious person. We don't know that much about him. Uh, Shabani, maybe we can open it up for questions if there are any. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nirika, are there any questions? Uh, nothing yet, but if anyone wants to ask a question, just reminding you, you can add it in the comment section. Okay. And we'll take them. So if anyone has any questions. Uh, meanwhile, you all can go ahead. I think if there's a question, I'll just I'll alert you. Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, so okay. maybe maybe another passage would you like to read? Yeah, sure. Let me think of one. Um, let's get something from. Um, okay, this is a funny one from the trial. Let's get the trial. So, poor George. You've seen his picture when he is um, when he has been arrested. You know, he's wearing this three-piece check suit, and he can't. He's not allowed to change. So he keeps wearing the same. Then he thinks, OK. OK, I'll, I'll read a short passage. So this is a chapter called A Trial in Staffordshire. And it's about, um, yeah, well, it's the trial. To the gathered media and crowds, the man sitting in the front of the Staffordshire Quarter Sessions Court on 20th October looked every bit the dark oriental with a deep secret. His eyes were slightly bulgy, his lips were thick, and he had a prominent cleft on his chin. He had a thick moustache and his dark hair was neatly combed. It was two months since his arrest on that fateful August morning. Present in the courtroom were his parents, Shapurji and Charlotte, and his sister Maud. His gray-haired mother took notes as the hearing progressed, his elderly father, who had conducted Sunday services for so many years in the local church and who had married the residents of the village and consoled them at the funerals of their loved ones, now looked helpless and forlorn, the tension of the last few months clearly showing on his face. The family looked a model of righteousness and honor. 
unlikely relatives of a man accused of such heinous crimes. Also seated in the courtroom was Elizabeth Foster, the maid who had been fired from the Idalji house and sworn her revenge. It was not clear whether she had been brought in as a witness. The Staffordshire police were out in full force to give evidence under the watchful eye of their chief, Captain Anthony. The tension in the courtroom could be cut with a knife. Okay, I'll skip this little detail. Uh, before his trial, George had asked for permission to change his clothing as he had been wearing the summer suit he had been arrested in for the last three months. The request was refused. Prisoners were required to be tried in the clothes worn when apprehended. George was told that a prisoner or a murder charge in a nearby cell had to appear in his bloodied clothes so the jurors could see the full horror of the crime. That, thought George, was an acceptable rule for a prisoner denied bail. However, as someone who had been granted bail and would have been allowed to stay at home if he'd wanted, <coughs> excuse me, George questioned the rule. But the police were firm. He was not even allowed to change his shoes or the straw hat he had worn in August and which was totally unsuitable for late October. <coughs> excuse me. George felt that his unsuitable clothes and appearance itself could prejudice a jury who were not aware of the rules. The day before his trial, he asked to be shaved, but was told that such a thing was unheard of at Stafford. He could only be clipped with the nippers. Since the court was sitting from early morning till late, there was no chance for him to get a clip. Consequently, George appeared before the jury, the press, and the public, sporting a light three-piece check suit, a worn-out boot, and a rather overgrown moustache. The Sunderland Daily Echo reported, the prisoner was unshaven, and his appearance was even more oriental than before. His thick lips were pursed and his large black eyes fixed on the witnesses. <laughs> so you can see that George, I mean, he is marked by his appearance, really. It just dogs him all the way. <laughs> and, uh, but the funny thing is, excuse me, the minute that he has the backing of Arthur Conan Doyle, this whole press changes its tune. <laughs> Suddenly, Sherlock Holmes is investigating the case and, you know, they're all championing George. They say he could never have done it. And his Asiatic appearance should not be the reason he is sentenced. So complete change, change, you know, that you have a little celebrity backing, it shows what you can do. And that is what happens, George. Uh, so it's all, you know, it, it reflects the society as well. The whole case reflects what's going on in society. And you know, this sort of coverage happens even now yeah. at all court trials and everything else. So everyone is judged the whole time by the media. You have these media trials everywhere. <laughs> and uh, so it's so relevant, I think, even today. I think we have uh, maybe a couple of minutes. If there are no other questions, then I have a last question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there is one question. Uh, Saz asked, did he and his family visit India over the years? Oh, no. <laughs> no. Once Shapuji left India, he never went back. And uh, George, of course, had no connections with India. Um, mm. It was very interesting for me because at this time that all this is happening, uh, in British politics, the only three MPs who ever joined the House of Commons were Parsis. You know, so the first Indian MP... Uh, in the House of Commons is Dadabai Nauroji, somebody, you know, Indians know very well as the grand old man of India. And um, so he is there from, he is elected in 1892 and he lasts one term. And then we have, he's followed by another MP called Mancharji Bhaunagri, who was uh, also Parsi and also, uh, but he was a Tory. So Dadabai was a liberal, uh, Mancharji is a Tory. And then we had the third MP, who is Shapurji Saklatwala. Uh, he was also born in Bombay, came here, and he is from the Communist Party. So we had three, the only three MPs of Indian origin, pre-independence, are all Parsis. And what I found is that one of them was in, you know, was actually a sitting MP at the time when all this is happening, these trials, 1906. But Shapurji never, I saw no evidence that he ever went to these MPs. Uh, and asked for help and said what he was going through. Because in Dadabai Naraji was also from Elphinstown College. There's a direct bond over there. You know, they're all from Bombay. But I think he had left his 
Parsi roots behind and he was proud he didn't go back to them. So he just went to the police and he went to the press and he tried his best. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's how it happened. They had no connection left with India. I'm hoping some Indian families show up. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, Adalji is out there. So the father, Shapurji's father is called Doralji Adalji. And Shapurji had brothers and sisters. There must be some Adalji's around. <laughs> There, there is a question, uh, Shravani, which is uh, related to what you are saying. Uh, mm -hmm. Sonia is asking whether uh, this was covered by the Indian press at that time. Yes, um, it wasn't covered by the Indian press, uh, but it was noticed by Jawaharlal Nehru, who wrote a letter to his father, Motilal yes. Nehru. Yes. Now, Nehru at that time was a student. He was an 18-year-old student in Harrow, Harrow School. And he saw the press coverage. And he wrote to his father saying that this is incredible. Uh, press coverage that it's getting, and this poor man was probably targeted because he was an Indian. So it's noticed uh, by um, by Nehru, but I didn't see. I mean, I see no, saw no evidence of it being covered by the local Indian media. Um, so unfortunate. Maybe there were some articles, uh, you know, when Arthur Conan Doyle came, but I haven't seen any. <laughs> okay, my last question to you is uh, which event uh, of history is now haunting you? What's your next book? <laughs> oh, God, no. What has been haunting me in the whole of last year was this lockdown. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I need to, you know, we've all been just working endlessly. And uh, it's been very busy because I'm a journalist as well. So, you know, the work mm -hmm. comes and then this. In fact, you know, before our talk today, today's, there's been like quite a tragedy here because uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, has died. Yeah, yeah, uh, and the yeah. news broke just after noon today. So for the two hours just before I went, <laughs> you know, came on the show, I was filing about his death. Uh, uh, so, yeah, 99. He would have turned 100 in the summer. But so it is it is quite sad. And, you know, one is quite used to seeing him with the Queen. But um, yeah, so it's been a very, very hectic year. And uh, yeah, I think one needs a break. I've not had a holiday at all. <laughs> And uh, things will stir, but I'm in no hurry. I'm not putting pressure on myself. <laughs> uh, but there's always something that stirs, and you know, I'm sure something will come up. But I take a long time to write my book, so it'll be a while. <laughs> how how long did you take uh, for this yeah. book? This took five years. Yeah. Okay. That's but there were little breaks because in between, Victoria and Abdul got made into the film, so mm -hmm. you know, I was distracted mm -hmm. with because I was a consultant on that. So there was a little bit of all that, and then. A lot of traveling because of Victoria and Abdul, you know, doing endless talks. Uh, mm. But um, but more or less, it took five years, yeah, <clears throat> right up to last year and the final drafting and rewriting and <laughs> restructuring. That is the toughest, you know. What do you keep in? <laughs> it's probably like a film, you know. What do you keep in on the cutting room floor? Or what do you throw out? Uh, mm, you know. Yeah. But how do you make this narrative? Where do you come into the plot? It's all all these things that have to be sorted out. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah. Thank <laughs> you, Shamani. It... Thank you for your time and thank you for this fabulous, wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for your books, which have always, you know, yeah. endeared to everybody. <laughs> That's this fabulous. So, oh, your gacha gacha should be on screen, <laughs> Vivek. I, I would <laughs> like to see that. <laughs> that is such a charming, charming, you know, book. It, it's amazing. Thank you so, <laughs> so much. Thank you. I hope more get translated so we can read more. <laughs> Thank you both so much again. Yeah, thank you both so much. That was an absolutely lovely conversation. Uh, to everyone watching, uh, you can get a copy of the book on our website, Fort Gacha Gacha, and the History of the Parsi Lawyer. Uh, so yeah, please do check out the book. And we hope to see both of you and all of our viewers someday in our store. I'm sure it'll happen. Thank you, Nirika. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Vivek. Thank Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Bye-bye.